you have to be able to just say, screw it. I'm here, I'm loud, I'm proud. We're going to do this scene. We're gonna crush it exactly. when the audience is gonna throw all their money at us. <laughs> Sometimes those criticisms aren't necessarily right. You know, it's a great idea, but it has to be educational. Because that's like our future thinkers, and, yeah. and they're already thinking outside of the box. I'm here today with Drew Clover, the instructor of our summer theater program. Drew, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me on the show. I'm really happy to be here, and I'm excited to see what I can do for this festival. Heck yeah. So I just want to kind of give a little bit of backstory. So tell us who you are, what you're doing now, kind of... A, a good synopsis of you. All right. Well, hot pot, try to put me on the spot, right? <laughs> so I, my name is Drew Clover, yes, and I was born in Santa Monica, California uh, in 1995. So I'm about 23, almost 24. And I have, I grew up separately from both parents. I lived effectively with my mother most of the time, but I had a lot of I had a really big influence from the nanny we had. Her name was Julia. She was that mother figure I had, and she kind of beat into me almost quite literally. <laughs> not not like in a loving sense though, art. Like she introduced me to classical music at a really young age and it never really clicked to me until I got into high school actually. I got the experience of my first theater class a little late on actually, my mm -hmm. junior year. So I had known about theater, I had gone to a couple plays, I had done the things, but I'd never like been involved. And I don't know what it was. I feel like I, I think it was because I needed an extra class to fill in the space. And so I took a theater class and my teacher's name was Shana Marquis. She was a wonderful woman in, she had, in the school and she was the main theater director. We had two. And, but she was the biggest one. And she just really introduced me to my first monologue. And that monologue was from The Zoo Story. The Zoo Story is by Edward Albee. He, it's a really absurdist play from the 50s. The monologue I did is all about the story between me and this dog who looks at me every time I enter the apartment. And <laughs> okay. we hate this dog and my plot to kill this dog with poisoned meat. The process I got to go through with that in storytelling. Where am I? Why do I not like this dog outside of what the script tells me? She really beat in psychology to me and that sparked a new love in psychology. Um, and just from then on, I started participating in plays, you know, first as an ensemble. Uh, when it was my last semester of my senior year when I got my first lead role, I got to play uh, Don Lockwood in Singing in the Rain. And that was one of the best times of my life. I had to learn the tap dancing numbers, having never tap danced in my life. So I was just like, eh. Uh, just tapping, trying to figure out how to do a full lap, and I kept calling it a Filipino for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was a process, but overall, it was a really fun experience. And then just from there, I got to start doing uh, more college theater. About that time is when I moved down to uh, the Valley in Arizona, which then took me to Northern Arizona University, uh, to which I just graduated um, last month, honestly. Oh, wow. Yeah, I have a double major in psychology, which is where that big old, uh, like, that spark came from, and theater performance. And so what I like to do, or hope to do, is combine those two, because I had a really good professor at Northern, Northern Arizona University, Dr. Bob Yao. He... He just took a big, soft approach to it and just subtly messed with your mind enough to where you got it. Mm -hmm. And man, did I need to get it. <laughs> it, was a it was a lot about just being real. I remember like almost during every performance, my first semester with him, I don't believe you is what he would say. And I'm like, what? And he's like, I don't believe you. And I just got it. It just felt like I wasn't be. He said I was. He, it felt like I was playing the character and not being the character. So I want to ask, when you, okay, whenever I I watch you you teach and almost any time someone gets into something like this for the first time, there's this wall, and they're like, well, I don't want to be silly, but I want to be an actor, and I'm always thinking like, dude, you have to not. You've mm. got to drop it. You got to not care. Mm -hmm. How do you break past it? How do you drop? I mean, like, okay, 
if you're going to be in this world as an mm-hmm. actor or theater in, in general. Or even a human being. <laughs> yeah. How do you lose the self-conscious like fear of, oh, I don't want someone to look at me like I'm silly, even though you're clearly trying mm-hmm. to be silly for the whole purpose of theater. Exactly. You know, you have to be able to just say, screw it. I'm here. I'm loud. I'm proud. We're going to do this scene. We're going to crush it. Exactly. And the audience is going to throw all their money at us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be rich. Yeah, man. I'm going to like go in, say a couple lines in this, or make a sound sometimes, yeah. and get paid $2,000. I'll never forget it. Mark Hamill, the guy, you know, Luke Skywalker, the Joker, all these people. This... He told a story once at a Comic-Con that I watched an interview of where he got paid $2,000 to sit in the room for 30 minutes, wait for his cue, and go, eh. And <laughs> I'm just like, what? What? Where's, where's my opportunity? I want to do that. Like, that's so, like, hilarious. Now, he is a legend upon legends, mm-hmm. like, ever since, like, the beginning of Star Wars, like, way long ago. And so he, you know, it's a little bit different for him, but, like, it's those jobs that exist. There's, yeah. And that's one thing that I don't think a lot of people in the theater world know. When you come on with theater, you think movies, TV, and stage. Mm. But there's also stuff like what we're doing now. Voice over work, podcasting, DJing, MCing, you know, being like these performance archetypes and just even like there's these things called wallas which are you know when you see a movie and there's like two people talking in a restaurant and you hear them totally clear but you also hear a soft background of like other people in the restaurant talking mm-hmm. to make it more believable that's what a walla is people there's like stuff in california for example where you can just you can apply they are sending a small audition and they'll hire you for like sometimes between anywhere 30 and 100 bucks or 150 bucks or so just depending on who what when where why and how long mm-hmm. just to be like how much and talk or like you could you'll actually have a conversation you know what about the weather you know it's great the rain's there the sun's shining and then they soften it down overlap it a little bit so it just sounds like a bunch of chatter oh, um, wow. the same person change your pitches and there you go two people are now a whole restaurant that are playing behind the uh, main actors and actor and actresses and that and they come home with like an extra 200 bucks for maybe an hour's worth of work hey man that's a good deal mm-hmm. so like if I'm getting into dance, I mm-hmm. which I do I do not dance and mm-hmm. I do not dance well. <laughs> so if I want to go and learn how to dance, but my whole thing is like, well, clearly my body does not flow mm-hmm. fluidly. So that's gonna that's gonna not look right. Other people are gonna be like, that guy dances awful. Mm-hmm. I just have to accept it. I mean, like, bottom line, you just gonna need to accept it. Oh yeah, you're gonna look weird. You're mm-hmm. gonna do some bad stuff. You're gonna mm-hmm. suck sometimes. But the second you're okay with it, no one else can hold it over your head. Yeah, and that's theater too. Like that, being the weird, confronting that fear, doing the thing, that is what theater is all about. And a lot of people like give up on theater too because they feel like they can't make the, they can't make it out there in like New York or Broadway. Mm-hmm. You can do a lot of theater and a lot of like performance work that has nothing to do with either of those things and mm-hmm. still make a living. I think the biggest facilitator of that and proof of that I've seen is voiceover. Yeah. It is not easy to break into it and get into it, but once you start getting like consistent jobs, it just becomes like your thing, you know? Especially like playing a lot of games, watching a lot of like animated shows. Mm-hmm. Like there is a couple of voice actors that I swear I have no idea how much time they have on their hands to be mm-hmm. like 50 million characters in 50 million different mediums. Oh, yeah. But they are like the bee's knees in the voice acting community. And I'm just like, man, they're just probably sitting in their like house. Like when they started, they're probably just sitting in their house recording audition mm-hmm. lines for hundreds of characters, just mm-hmm. one after another, one after another. <laughs> and then like two succeed. And now they're like the most A-list voice actor ever. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people don't. They don't understand that. They're like, well, I need to get called upon. I need, like, the golden ray of sunshine to shine on me for this opportunity. Mm -hmm. You just do a little bit of work, like, and really passionate about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, my 
gosh. It becomes just so much more fun. So too. much. You never work a day in your life if you're having fun. So, I want to just segue into our next question. Mm-hmm. But about theater as a whole, and especially what we're doing with the kids, the, the theater class, why do you think it is important? Um, wow, there's just so much in that question. Like, the first thing that comes to my mind is theater breaks shells. It gets people, especially children, to become more confident in themselves and become this person who they never thought they could be. And in some cases, it could start a lifelong passion like me. And just... And also, like, with this, this all translates from, the, all this comes from theater, but it translates into the world, too. Now, you're more confident. Now, you're more, like, accepting of yourself. You've been given that boost. I think it makes everything very relatable. And it puts mm-hmm. it in a, whether it's a movie or an actual play, it definitely puts it in a, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't even know the word. I'm going to say delivery system. Okay. That is, uh, it's not easy to avoid. Because mm-hmm. if you go watch a movie that really moves you, you might not ever watch that movie again, but it's in the back of your head. You'll never forget it. You come to a theater one way, and you always leave a different way. Mm-hmm. And that's the actor's job, too, to make the audience leave differently than they came in. All right, so I got one final question for you. Of course. If you can go back to the beginning of your theater career mm-hmm. so far, I know it's still early in the process, but like mm-hmm. back your junior year, what was something you could tell yourself now or that you learn now that you may not have known back then. Stop lying. <laughs> Stop pretending to be someone you're not. Like, I struggled a lot with ident- with that identity crisis. And I did that for years and years. Um, you know, because it worked. People mm-hmm. were easy to fool. And that's a really mean thing to say. But that's who I was back then. And I'm lucky that... I've been able to facilitate a change in that I'm no longer like that. But back then, back when I was like 17, junior year, I'm like, dude, just stop. Just be honest. Tell the girl you like her. Tell, be, do the monologue. Tell your teacher you're struggling, you know, and then commit. Commit to the play and don't feel like you're the worst one in the class because you're not. You're all learning.